To hear the Bush administration tell it, the economy is strong. The tax cuts it has implemented have helped propel economic growth, and the U.S. is moving full speed ahead. The Democrats beg to differ. It's a recovery, but fueled by tax cuts for the rich. There are fewer jobs for the middle class, and wages and benefits seem to be shrinking, not rising. What is really going on in the economy for the average worker? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today is Aaron Bernstein, a senior writer at Business Week who has written about the intersection between workers and the economy for 20-some years. Aaron, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Now, uh, President Bush and his economic team tell us that the economy is doing very well, it's getting stronger, new jobs are being created. Is that your sense from what you observe? It's true as far as it goes. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> new jobs are being created and the economy seems to be doing pretty well. It sort of goes in fits and starts, but it's, uh, it's been improving. And how does that feel <coughs> to your average worker? Are they participating in the... the well, growth? that's the as far as it goes problem, <laughs> which is we've lost three million jobs uh, in the you know, downturn of a couple years ago, and we haven't gained them back yet. And that, of course, when you know, the demand for labor is slack, workers feel the pinch. And it's not just the people who can't find jobs, but everybody else. Wages growth has been very sluggish. And in fact, workers' wages have declined on average, um, especially at the bottom, but also at the average in the last few years. And it, that looks like it's finally starting to pick up a little bit. And projections are, you know, that it probably will gradually get better for workers, but it's been very slow. Is that because of energy costs uh, affecting them in the gas tank, or is there something more profound going on? Well, that's certainly hurt, and it's hurt, of course, people at the very bottom the hardest because it's a big hit to your income. Um, but no, mainly that just, uh, you know, the, the, the wage demand is, you know, the demand for labor is very low, and so nobody can get wage increases, you know. So even though inflation overall is very low despite the oil increases, you know, companies don't have to dole out pay hikes, and so they don't, you know, they, they watch their costs, and so workers' wages have been, you know, lagging inflation by and large, and in fact, there's been a, a, a clear shift towards uh, capital income and away from labor income overall in the whole economy, and productivity has continued throughout this sluggish period of the last few years to be very strong, and typically, you know, economists will tell you productivity is what pays for wage gains, and of course it does, but it doesn't mean that it has to translate into wage gains. So why isn't it? I mean, everybody says productivity, productivity, that we need to be able to make goods more efficiently, and if we do that, the economy will be stronger and workers will benefit. You're saying that's not happening. Why not? Well, for the same, largely speaking, the same reasons that, you know, we've had wage problems back through the 1970s. I mean, we've had, you know, falling or uh, slowly rising wages for almost 30 years now. We've had a couple of periods of very strong um, economic growth uh, where workers have benefited. You know, in the late 80s we had it a little bit. Uh, in, the, in the late 90s we had it a lot. You know, that was the first time that unemployment got down to 4% and stayed there in you know, a generation, three decades, and boy, does it show, you know, workers' wages shot up, uh, wages across the economy shot up, you know, and there were real wage gains, for, uh, fa average families had real family incomes, you know, soaring, and then the recession came uh, in 2000, 2001, and we're sort of back to the same pattern, you know, which is there's all these forces that have been pushing down wages for several decades, and those forces, um, you know, continue to function and, and, and... Which which forces are you talking about? Well, there's a number of them. Uh, globalization is certainly one. Um, that obviously hits manufacturing workers the hardest and has. It's now spreading to service and white-collar workers. Uh, you know, technology has largely cut against lower-skilled workers. Unfortunately, lower-skilled means the bottom... You know, in this context of, of technology, um, 
it means the bottom 70, 80 percent of the workforce because that's a big bottom. That's a big <laughs> bottom. You know, people keep saying, you know, go get a college education, and that's all fine. But you know, only about 25 percent of the U.S. workforce has a college education, and the you know studies on technology show that basically it's college-educated workers who have benefited, and everybody else has lost out. So that has been a big blow to workers' wages. How Immigration has been another factor. You know, we've let in or people, we didn't let them in, they came in, millions of people, mostly from Mexico in the last 10 years. We've had record immigration. And, you know, you can get your, your, your lawn mowed by illegal immigrants. You can, you know, you get your factories, um, filled. you know, filled with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of labor, you know, you know millions and millions of uh, illegal immigrants, and also illegal, but mostly illegal. And that has kept wages down, again, particularly at the bottom. How about unions? Why aren't we seeing uh, them step in and help organize? Well, traditionally unions, of course, uh, across most economies have been the way that workers have grabbed some of the productivity gains and achieved, you know, middle class living standards. That's what happened in this country in the 1900s and the early part of the 20th century. It happened throughout Europe. It's happened in, you know, most, uh, uh, well, all, all advanced countries. Um, and, you know, about 20 something years ago, uh, U.S. employers decided that they were going to go to war against unions, and they have largely won. Um, unions are basically uh, almost a spent force in economically. You know, they're politically they're still pretty strong because they have a lot of members, relatively speaking. You know, 16 million, um, and they have a lot more people who are sympathetic to them, and they have a fair amount of money. But you know, they represent 13 percent of the workforce. They used to be, you know, more than double that 30 years ago. And at those levels, they can't influence wages. And employers are, uh, have such uh, power in the workplace that unions have been unable to grow and, in fact, keep shrinking. So the one you know, vehicle that workers have had historically to overcome all these sort of negative factors cutting against their wages, like globalization and immigration, has been unions. And they don't have that anymore. When you add this all up as a journalist and you go out and talk to people, what's the impact on people's lives of these kinds of economic forces? What do you see out there? Well, I think the families, uh, especially lower income families, are definitely struggling. Um, there's no question about that. It's harder to get along. And, you know, one of the ways that American families, even lower income ones and certainly average ones, have, you know, compensated for all these negative wage trends in the last few decades is they've worked more hours. And basically what that means is women have worked more hours. You know, it hasn't really been men. It's a little bit men, you know, have taken second jobs or worked longer hours. But by and large, you know, women have moved into the workforce in the last 30 years. So if you look at the family as an economic unit, instead of putting in, you know, the average 2,000 hours a year, you know, it's now up to about 3,000. I mean, there's been a huge increase in labor hours by families. And that's compensated. So family income has grown even though wages have by and large lagged. You know, we've kind of run out of steam on that, um, especially when job growth is sluggish. There's just not that many jobs to be had. You know, that worked fine in the boom periods, especially in the 90s when, you know, anybody could get a job doing almost anything. Um, it's harder to do now, so families struggle more. You know, if you look at the unemployment rate, I think it's around 5.5 percent at this mm -hmm. point. That doesn't seem that bad. I mean, it's pretty much where it was during the Clinton administration. Um, that's why, if, if things were this bad and, and you really had so many people out of work, why wouldn't that number be higher? Well, things aren't that bad. I mean, you're right. Unemployment has been at 10 percent. You know, the question is, at what level do wages and incomes grow? At what, what kind of demand strength do you need in the economy? And the late 90s made it pretty clear. You, you need under 5 percent. I mean, it used to be for, you know, decades after World War II that labor economists said that the, um, you know, the unemployment rate at which wages grew was about, you know, full employment is what the term they use, was 4 percent. And then in the 70s and 80s, you know, they, they sort of weren't sure anymore. Um, now it's pretty clear 4 percent is where wages grow, and we're not at 4 percent. So even though we're not at 10, you know, at 10 percent, you're going to see a lot bigger wage declines than we've seen. Right now we've seen, you know, some sluggishness, wages have lagged inflation, but not by much. Is so it, there's some demand. Is it possible that the 5.5 percent isn't a true capturing of what's going on as well, that you're undercounting because some people have just dropped out of the labor market? Uh, that has happened. You know, there's been a lot of sort of debate about that amongst experts, you know, uh, people who are, you know, discouraged workers, uh, you know, people who decided, well, there's no job, so I'm not even going to be looking, and so then they don't count 
as unemployed, and there's definitely some of that. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell because we had a lot of that at other periods as well. Um, is, is one of the responses um, <coughs> that people can no longer pay for things like health insurance? Are they, are they getting the same benefits that they used to have uh, in the jobs that they do have? Well, benefits have been a, a, a big struggle, especially health care, of course. Um, I mean, if you look at the overall inflation rate, it's been pretty tame. But health care has been going up at several times the rate of inflation. I mean, and it's been happening. It, you know, it, it slowed down the rate of increase in health care costs for, for some years, almost 10 years. Now it's shot back up double digits, went up 11% this year, 12 or 13% last year. And, you know, when it costs $10,000 a year to insure a family, you know, an 11% increase, $1,000 plus a year, that's a big hit. And employers pay most of that, but workers are increasingly, you know, being confronted with having to pay more. So in addition to having low wages, many are, are struggling to keep up with health insurance premiums or don't have them at all. Well, that's right. What's happening, of course, is the uninsured uh, population has increased. It increased again. The numbers just came out from the Census Bureau earlier this month showing, you know, several million more uninsured. We're up, now up to, I don't remember what it was, 45 or 6 million, up from 44, I think it was. Um, and mostly that's people who work at smaller companies. Uh, those companies have a hard time paying $10,000 a year on top of a uh, wage. I mean, this is a tough problem. This is a national problem. It's not, I mean, I think of this as somewhat separate from the labor demand problem we were talking about in terms of the shift, uh, you know, and the gains from productivity. I mean, mm -hmm. to some degree, it's all the same because it's all, you know, how well, it's much the economy It's what companies can earns. afford to pay and what workers can afford to, to take and accept. Well, that's right. But, you know, what's a little bit different here is we're competing against other countries where employers don't bear the burden of health costs because they most of them have nationalized health care one way or another. So the United States, you know, is very fiercely, you know, sort of uh, free market and private sector, and we, we cling to this private market health care system, and it, it hurts employers. They don't want to change it for their own reasons, mostly ideological as far as I can tell, but uh, that's, a, that's a big drag in terms of our competitiveness, and so it causes problems in the economy. Well, and if you're a new worker coming into the workforce, you, there's a good chance that the companies are not going to be offering the same packages that they were to older well, workers. Well, that's exactly right. So it's right. pitting worker against worker. Yeah, I don't know how sustainable that is. It depends on labor demand in the long run. But boy, the, you know, we had a four and a half, five month uh, strike of supermarket workers in Los Angeles, you know, late last year and early this year, and um, that was largely over this question. And you know, the employers, you know, Safeway and Kroger's and Albertsons are the big three national chains, they won, and they said, you know, new workers are going to have, you know, about a third of the health care coverage um, that existing workers have. And that is the trend, you know. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Brew College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Aaron Bernstein, a senior writer at Business Week. Aaron, we're in the midst of an incredibly tough presidential race. Can you talk a little bit about how the two candidates uh, see this issue and how, what they would do about it? You mean the issue of uh, families and, and, and wages? Yeah. Um, well, both of them, of course, say they're going to help, um, as you would expect politicians <laughs> to say. They have, you know, radically different approaches, as we've seen in the last few years between, you know, Bush and Clinton. Um, you know, by and large, uh, President Bush still endorses uh, tax cuts um, as a solution for, you know, helping families. And there's no question that the tax cuts that he's pushed through in the last four years did do something to put money in workers' pockets. Mostly, of course, you know, 80, 90 percent of it went to people who um, are in the top, you know, 10 percent or more of uh, the income brackets. So it did very little, you know, in terms of helping the rest of us. Um, but it did something, you know, there's no question about that. Now he, it's not really clear how much more Bush can do. He keeps talking about reforming the tax code, helping families, but, you know, he's spent all the surpluses on his tax cuts that he's already given. 
so it's not clear how much more he can do on that score. He's talking about overhauling the tax code entirely and moving the whole tax system away from income taxes towards some kind of consumption or sales tax. And his rationale, is the Republican rationale, is that the way to have faster economic growth is to lower the tax rates on capital, which spurs investment in their mind. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, debatable by economists. So, you know, it's, it's a fine theory. It, um, somebody's got to pay to keep the government going, and so then there, it would shift more of the burden onto families. And that would be very painful, certainly, in the short run. I mean, if you believe that economic argument, it would still take some years for economic growth to, you know, speed up enough to offset the increased tax burden on average and low-income families. Um, How about Senator Kerry? What are some of the proposals that he's put out there? Well, he certainly is uh, also talking about tax cuts. Not he, what he wants to do is reverse most of the Bush tax cuts, you know, take it away from the wealthy and give it to the middle class and poor. Um, you know, that would probably help. That's, you know, he also wants to, you know, the, probably the main thing economically in his platform is a major health care plan, which would, you know, spend some huge sums of money, you know, um, sort of debatable how much, but, you know, upwards of $600 billion over 10 years, um, to basically have the government be the insurer for catastrophic health care, um, which would take a major burden off of employers and the economy. Um, and that would go a long way towards easing at least part of the pain on workers. You know, he also has, um, you know, an energy program. He has a fair amount of other pieces in his platform that might give some marginal help to families. I don't see any big things that's going to change, you know, the fundamental equation, which is without full employment, average wages in America for 30 years, as I was saying before, are on a low, you know, on a long-term, uh, you spiral. know, downward spiral. And all the forces of globalization and technology and immigration, none of that's going to stop. And, you know, unless so either one of these guys can deliver sustainable 4% uh, you know, unemployment and, you know, 3% GDP growth a year, that's not going to change. I mean, and, you know, Kerry has uh, gotten a lot of support from labor unions, and they are determined, as they have been for years, to sort of start growing again. And if they did that, they could help, you know, workers wrest some of the gains uh, from productivity back from employers. It's not at all clear that Kerry's going to make any substantive difference on that. Um, the unions okay. want the laws changed to make unionization easier to stop employers from, you know, beating up on them when they ask people if they want to join a union. I don't know that Kerry will go along with that. How much can a president <clears throat> really do? I mean, is it fair to even expect, uh, you know, the CEO of this country, if you will, to actually be able to, to make substantive changes? I mean, these are profound economic forces that you're describing that may just be inevitable. Well, there are uh, actually... I think that's somewhat of a myth that's been perpetrated by, you know, even both sides of the, uh, both political parties. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is a conscious policy decisions. I mean, we have deliberately endorsed free trade agreements going back for decades, especially in the last 10 years. Clinton did and Bush did, both of them. Uh, that hurt workers, you know. We have, you know, endorsed implicitly or otherwise uh, immigration, and we have certainly had a very clear policy stances towards uh, deunionization. You know, we've supported employers as they have uh, undercut unions. You know, we've let the minimum wage lag in, you know, Clinton got it boosted, you know, once in his entire eight years. Um, those are all policy decisions. You know, we have very conscious policy decisions. Now, you know, the rationale is we're going to get stronger economic growth. And over the last three decades since these policies that hurt workers have been put into effect, we've had one real period where you could argue there was some payoff, which was the late 90s. And aside from that, those policies have hurt average Americans. But if you take the alternative point of view that, you know, you're, what you're suggesting is we should not have free trade, we should restrict immigration, we should allow an increase in unionization, won't that create an increasingly inflexible economy where you're basically protecting antiquated industries, inefficient companies, and do workers really benefit in that economy? There's certainly a risk. That's, that's been the standard criticism, which is why we've pursued these policies. 
Um, you know, the way I look at it is if you, if you look at the experience that Europe has had in the last, uh, you know, couple of decades, they've been accused by Americans primarily um, of just, of pursuing policies just like the ones you're talking about with all the attendant downside risks. And they have had lower growth than we have, lower economic growth. Yet the bottom 80% of their uh, population has fared better than the bottom 80% of the American population. In, in what ways? Because they've got a bigger share of the economic pie. The pie grew more slowly, but the bottom 80% gets a bigger share. So we've had 3% GDP growth, you know, a year. And most of the benefit, in fact, as near as I can tell, almost all of the net benefit of the extra growth has gone to the upper 20%. So, yeah, all our policies are, allow for flexibility and faster growth, and all the benefits go to the people at the top. Well, um, I think, that's again, That's not the necessarily how you want to run an economy. That's how we run ours, but I don't think it's in the interest of most Americans. Do you hear anyone in the political arena discussing this topic? Not at all, which is why I don't think, I mean, I do agree with, you know, you saying, I don't think that whichever person wins is going to make a lot of decisions. I, I, my main point here is it's not inevitable. These are policy decisions that we make. The Democrats could make different ones. The Republicans could make different ones. Neither of them choose to. They both agree with a basic premise. The Democrats didn't used to agree with this. They, you know, the country has shifted to the right in the last couple of decades, and Democrats have found themselves not disagreeing increasingly, you know, I think not out of ideological conviction so much, but out of, you know, what they consider to be political necessity. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, free trade, you know, Clinton endorsed free trade because he believed it. The rest of the party, by and large, didn't. He dragged them into it. Well, Kerry is very supportive of uh, trade agreements. Well, actually, he's sent out a lot of mixed messages. He's been getting attacked by trade economists um, for not being supportive enough and for making noises about you know, being too protectionist, of course, is the language that's used. But it's at not the same at time, fair. he does say that he supported the trade agreements, and now he might tinker with them a little bit, but in essence, he's still a free trader at heart, wouldn't you say? Probably in the end. It's not clear. Um, it's, it's not at all clear. He certainly um, made noises on, on both sides of uh, this issue. If you're a, a low-income family member, what you're saying is, Neither political party is going to be helpful to you in any significant way. And we're in a world where wages are going to continue to be downward pressure on wages at the low end of the economy. Is, is that, that's a pretty that's negative pretty much picture. Right. The only way that uh, average Americans and certainly poor Americans are going to see any substantial gains in wages or incomes is if we return to an economy like the boom times of the late 90s. And um, what's out there to help us do that? I mean, you know, why did it happen? It was sort of a fluke in 30 years. We, we, the last time we had an economy like that was the 1960s. And, you know, we've been struggling. Everybody wants that, you know. Everybody's policies are, you know, all these growth policies are aimed at that. But uh, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I hope it will. How about the minimum <clears throat> wage? What if they raise that? That would certainly help. Um, there's no question about it. At this point, you know, we, we've, this is one of the longest periods without a raise in the minimum wage. It's 1997, you know. At this point, the real value of the minimum wage is, you know, approaching a low point in terms of purchasing power. And um, where do the candidates inflation. stand on, on that? Well, certainly uh, the Republicans have, you know, never wanted a minimum wage increase. They always resist it because, of course, employers, they don't want to pay more, you know, understandably. You know, that's, nobody wants to. If you run a business, you've got to pay out. Uh, the Democrats have pushed for it. Kerry has, uh, you know, made some noises. that he, I mean, I'm sure he would support one. There's no question. The Democrats mm -hmm. keep pushing to try to get it passed now. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, uh, that might help a little bit, but not very much. Well, the history of the minimum wage increases has they've been one-time deals. I mean, there's, for years and years, we've had arguments about indexing the minimum wage, linking it to something like average wages or inflation, so that it would just be automatic. We wouldn't keep having these debates, you know, so that the people at the bottom would just get brought along with the rest of us. That's never happened, and so what happens is you have a big fight. It drags on for years. We raise it once, and then it just slowly drifts, you know, right. back down as inflation eats away the value of... Uh, people's wages at the bottom. Not a pretty picture. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing your thoughts with us. We've been very fortunate to have Aaron Bernstein, a senior writer at Business Week, as our guest today. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. 
Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. So far, the presidential campaign has focused almost exclusively on terrorism and national security issues. But at the end of the day, we also have to live, which to most of us means finding ways to earn enough money to pay our rent or mortgage, feed and clothe our children, and maybe, if we're lucky, go out for an occasional meal or to see a movie. On this topic, the presidential contenders offer starkly different approaches. President Bush wants to continue to cut taxes and shift responsibility away from government and into individual hands for everything from health care to retirement benefits to worker training. He calls it the ownership society. Senator Kerry wants to strengthen the government safety net for those at the lower end of the income scale, extend health care insurance to children and low-income adults, and penalize companies that outsource work and profits overseas. Dramatically different philosophies with dramatically different policies. Yet our culture leads us to focus on questions like whether Kerry is a war hero or not, and whether the documents about Bush's National Guard service are real or forged. Figure out which candidate's economic policies would really help you and our country. And please remember to vote. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.